we know that the uh, uh Machari was strongly at trying to affiliate his yoga calling it ashtanga yoga indeed with patanjali now where does you know patanjali's viewpoint fit in with ramanuja um and is uh, and is the patanjalian perspective on yoga the one that krishnamacharya is is trying to present here or was trying to present and and did uh, patavi joy circumscribe to that well as i understand it the the mysore scholars always made a very clear differentiation between philosophy and religion they all come from families that worship certain deities and have certain religious backgrounds, but they try to kind of keep that to one side. Um, and the difference between Patanjali's yoga and the yoga of the Bhagavad Gita are pretty stark. So, hmm. so what Guruji BNS Iyengar always said, and what Tarachar echoed, was that Patanjali is about self realization. And and that you know, there's really very little reference to any kind of deity in, in, in Dante. There's just this this uh, Ishwara Pranidana thing. Mm -hmm. And and also in Sankhya, which which is the previous philosophy that yoga sort of builds upon, you don't find any reference to Godhead or deity. There's there's Jivatma and Paramatma, but they, they're not so much about bhakti. So anyway, simply put, according to the big guys, Patanjali's yoga leads to self-realization. Natha Muni's yoga or, or yoga the Bhagavad Gita leads to God realization. So then we have this horrible question like what is God and who, which one and <clears throat> who do I have to sign up with and Oh my God, whose who's approval do I need to be part of this thing? And I'm sure I've done something rather wrong. And <laughs> God, to me, and all of our sort of Western Christianity based uh, misconceptions. Yeah. Well, I suppose, I mean, remember, Patabi Joyce always used to say, uh, you know, when, when you understand everything is God, right? You say, like, everything, you know, God looking or something like that. There was a quote, wasn't there? You know, about, you know, the, ever, you know, the God, you know, kind of Advaita kind of esque take on God, right? Rather than a, you know, a, do we find more of a devotional aspect to Krishnamacharya and his in his uh, the way that he's taking it? Yeah, yeah. That's basically it. Their worldview is simply that the whole world is the body of God, mm. and so that really did my head in because you know, I mean, I take these things quite literally, and and that's a different worldview than I had previously. I I can say because. I sort of like some parts of the world, and I think that those are <laughs> good and holy. You know, I like roses and sunsets and uh, beautiful yoga postures, but I don't like dead possums or, uh, you know, <laughs> nuclear war or uh, there's so many there's things. There's a whole, that, yeah, there's so many things. Yeah, <laughs> especially now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have the list of <laughs> you know, here all day. So, you know, how, how can... Um, all of this terrible stuff going on in the world be God. Mm. Fundamental issue. Mm. But um, God's body has two parts, perfect and pollution. And um, they basically insist that all of these unfoldments are the, the organs of perfectity and that uh, it's all for the evolution of the soul. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer. In the evolution of your soul. <laughs> mm. So, um, no, that's an unanswerable question, anyway. That, you know, but um, fundamentally, whole world's the body of God. Try to cultivate love and affection for God, which means everyone and everything around us, which uh, I find to be very challenging at some moments. <laughs> you know, I, and so, yeah. so the, the reason to practice all these asanas and to practice the pranayama and to practice everything it is to define ourselves and, and to remember also that that every action, every word, every thought is, is, is karma and, and has a repercussion in our life. And that if we practice the asanas, we refine our nervous systems and, and we clean up. And it offers a much higher quality of life 
And I think that you and me and everybody that's practiced yoga for many years would would firmly agree with that. Now, where mm, mm, mm. that is a whole other issue. But but the asanas are a fundamental way of entering into a different worldview. Hmm. I sp- so go ahead. No, I was going to say, I suppose often my quandary, my battle is between the Advaita perspective, which seems kind of imminent, right? So that, you know, this is what there is, right? Everything is one. You're experiencing it now. There is nothing other outside better to aim for in the future. There is no future. There is no person to aim for. And then, you know, qualified and which is, you know, not a million miles away from from dualism really is saying, well, this world, it's kind of imperfect. It's, it's matter, it's prakriti, right? And, you know, refining that prakriti, you'll gradually understand that the nature of yourself and Purusha and you will transcend this world, you know, in, uh, you know, and samsara gradually in some place better in the future. Um, I mean, uh, is that, you know, I mean, who, who believed what in that capacity? Did was Krishnamacharya, do you think, aiming for, for the next life, or was he, you know, teaching a yoga for this life? How did he stand on that? For this life. I, I think that mm. is the specific uh, thing about uh, about Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, is that it's supposed to give liberation in one life. Right. Uh, you can make it this time. Jump on the wagon. <laughs> it's just the thing. And that's why it's very radical practice. Uh, and, and I think I think we can agree that that um, people who start doing yoga every day at the same time in the same place, and it doesn't matter if you're in your living room or if you're going if you live in New York City and you go to a Mysore Ashtanga class at 6 a.m. every morning, you start falling into that that very powerful ancient rhythm where you're doing this thing every single day. <laughs> I need to do this yoga to, to alleviate these, this, uh, you know, negativity and depression that sometimes troubles me. And uh, I don't care who you are. Life has its challenges and we have our ups and our downs. Yoga really helps us to find an up. Mm. I mean, he famously called it a practice for householders, right? Uh, and that was the whole idea that Krishnamacharya was a father and was a family man, you know, and were living in the world, the same with Batavi Joyce. Um, but what, I mean, what would a practice not for householders mean? And why, why is this particularly good for householders? Well, my first teacher who introduced me to a strong a Cliff Barber, who passed away a year or two ago. Mm. He was a renunciate. Mm. Kids are always more powerful. I don't care. Like you, if you have kids, and I have four of them, so I can tell you, it's terrible for your yoga practice. Okay, like staying up all night with crying babies, being immersed in the material world, and having to earn money and having to take care of other people relating with another person as your partner. And all of this takes a tremendous amount of energy. Mm. Uh, it's worth it. And I, I you know, I'm not knocking householder life. I am one. But if one should decide to forego all that and just study and practice and cultivate oneself without in, involving oneself in, in relations with other people, and creating a family which inevitably ties you to the material world. Of course, you have a lot more attention and a lot more time to de- dedicate to your spiritual practice. It's a pretty obvious thing. So they're always a bit more intense. So it was kind of like a compressed, like yesterday it was kind of compressed, kind of supercharged kind of practice that you could do and get kind of get this, the idea is you could kind of do it and get the same results in less time. You know, like I think so. I, that that's very much the the uh, idea that Sri B N S A Ingar puts forward in his talks and his his philosophy. This is a very concentrated practice, and it's for people who want to achieve liberation in this life. And and so so I believe that they're using the Hatha Yoga methodology. Mm. Mm. That it is a hybrid. 
and what we can say about Krishnamacharya and the people that he taught, never mind whether they're Shivites or Vaishnavas, it is that he was a kind of ambassador who took these radical Hatha Yoga practices and formatted them into something that the world could relate to uh, and, and made it scientific. He, he made it about health. He made it uh, hmm. to the masses. And, yeah. and he, that genius really does, um, that credit goes to him, but it also goes to the royal family of Mysore who hmm. paid, paid him to do it and put him up to it. And they, they yeah, were, and probably tolerated him as well. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there grou are. Grouchy kind of character that he was. But, but I mean, why didn't he teach anyone the philosophy part of it? You know, the, the background that he had in this uh, Matthew Mooney Sampradaya. I mean, he taught the kids the asana part of it. He never taught the philosophy. And your teacher, BNS, Ian Gar, um, also was taught by Krishnamacharya, I believe. And he taught you philosophy, I think. But Tabi Rice, again, didn't teach that philosophy to anyone. Well, I think that they saw them as different things. Um, right. Krishnamacharya definitely did teach philosophy and he was did. A yeah. professor. But not to his yoga students. Yeah. No, because they were a bunch of kids. It's, it's like, you know, if you have a yoga student in your class who's 14, are you going to sit them down and tell them about the yamas and nayamas and all this stuff? Not really. Uh, they, they just keep doing your asanas and uh, we can talk about that later. But if you had somebody come to your class who was, you know, in their 40s and going through certain things in their life and had some really sincere questions to ask you, you might really go into it. Right. Stuff. So it was it kind of felt it wasn't relevant, but, you know, inherently relevant, like kind of like a more mechanistic thing. You do this and you're going to get that experience, right? Like you don't need to kind of understand it cerebrally. I mean, you know, because his kids, you know, would have grown up and, and at a certain point, right, they were 18, 19 at a certain point, I think. Uh, BKS Iyengar talks about someone, you know, teaching him who was a, you know, yeah, BKS himself was when he broke with Krishnamacharya, not that young, you know, who could have been, could have been it's chatting true. to him on a philosophical level, couldn't he? But he didn't, didn't really get any of that. Well, I think they were somewhat choosy about who they, who they imparted their, their knowledge to. And that was considered a much higher level of mm. They're not necessarily going to tell you about all that unless you ask them and, and ask them in just the right way at the right moment and they feel like it. That, that's a good <laughs> access. So, um, the Tommy Joy students speak English very well. Not well enough to get deeply into philosophy. And, and it's such an eloquent and deep subject we struggle to understand it even with people who do speak very good English because Sanskrit words, as you know, are not, we don't have equivalents for those in, in English. You know, you take something like the word karma, uh, it, it takes hours to discuss what that actually means and all of its implications. And it really, I think it takes years of listening to different people speak about it in different contexts before we start to really piece together the full uh, interpretation of some of these terms that we throw around very casually mm. time in yoga. So it's a conversation amongst cultures. It's what, what I see yoga evolving into. And they're learning from us too. And it's a two-way street. And in, in yoga in India was not considered particularly interesting or special. It was something that had been around for a long time. It was the four people who went to Mysore and other parts of India. Mysore is not the only mm. place in India, of course. But it was these young people from the West, from Europe and America, who, who said, this is really amazing. I want to learn everything I can about this. I'm going to practice it every day. I want to take this as far as I can take it. Come over to America and teach everybody. Uh, this is a big deal. We're, we're going to... You know, it was really Patabi Joyce's early students, who most of whom I know, who brought the yoga out. So there is this beautiful conversation happening, I, I feel, you know, between cultures.
And yeah. That's what yeah. the other traditions conference and uh, retreats are all about. I'm very excited about my retreat coming up because Awar, Sri Awar is the Acharya of Nathan and Sampradaya. And I've, I've got him, he's agreed to take us to Melkote where he grew up and show us all around. We're going to do asanas uh, where Ramanuja bathed and prayed and, and just be in that world for a little while. And nobody can explain it as good as he can. Um, not only did he grow up in that place, but he, the leader of the tradition and yeah. he knows all this stuff. So we're basically trying to understand it ourselves, step, step at a time. And do your practice and all is coming. You know, that is the, this Abhyasa uh, Vairagya <laughs> term that, uh, so, so keep practicing and, and engaging in the spiritual practices and listen to everybody's ideas mm. and try to work it out for ourselves. Like, you know, what does that mean while I'm browsing Facebook? How am I practicing Vairagya <laughs> while I'm, well, that's relevant, yeah. actually. Uh, but it's life, isn't it? It's it's applied it's applied at philosophy, which is the only philosophy that's worth really debating with, you know. Um, so I really appreciate this conversation, um, Andrew. And people can find Andrew um, fairly easily on his Maestro Traditions. Um, he's interviewed and talked with so many of uh, Krishnamacharya's uh, students. Uh, there was a couple of them are still alive now, I think. And um, yeah, all kinds of interesting people who are not usually on the radar. So I fully recommend delving into Andrew's uh, world and Andrew's, um, you know, incredible amount of, um, you know, work you've done on this for, for everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, we're, we're doing a series of video um, lectures and courses take on different uh, different subjects. Like uh, we just finished one with Aditya Hurtayam, where Radio Hatio Pudipika. Uh, we've got Sri Alwar talking to teaching Gita to Sambha. So that'll be like 32, eight months worth of uh, study lectures as we go through this. But it's my own education, really. This is what I want to study. And yeah, gonna, yeah. I, it comes across. Yeah, it. yeah. So <laughs> Always just, <yeah. laughs> just you. No, I'm sure. I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. It's a you know a fascinating history, and I think you've done it justice in explaining it clearly. And yeah, as clear as it can be, um, you know, to uh, to to an audience who you know me included were completely unaware of any of this stuff until fairly recently, really. So um, yeah, thanks again for coming on, and um, I really thank appreciate you, that. Yeah, thank you.